It's Christmas in July at D. Geller & Son Jewelers, and that means D. Geller Diamond Dollars are back. All month long, earn 20% back on any in-store purchase towards anything in the store. That means you can come shop engagement rings for that beautiful summer vacation proposal and earn Diamond Dollars to cover the wedding bands. Christmas in July at D. Geller & Son is the perfect opportunity to get more value for your summer shopping. So come shop with Atlanta's favorite jeweler, D. Geller & Son, this summer in Atlanta, Kennesaw, and Sandy Springs, and online at dgeller.com. Today, we're diving into a topic that's as rich and complex as a well-aged Bordeaux, wine marketing. Whether you're a seasoned sommelier or just someone who enjoys a good glass of vino, this episode is for you. We'll uncork strategies, explore branding like a fine Chardonnay, and pair it all with the perfect digital vintage. So grab your favorite stemware, settle in, and enjoy this episode of The Marketing Mad Men. They say marketing is a madman's game. So now we turn it over to The Marketing Mad Men with Nick Constantino and Trip Joe. Welcome to The Marketing Mad Men. Nick Constantino here. It is Saturday. It is that time. It's crack some wine time. And I'm thrilled uh, that I get to host my first episode solely about wine. So let me introduce my guests. We have Beth Nowak and Michael Smith of Copper Cane Wines by Joe Wagner. Um, we'll explain what all that is, but most importantly, in front of us, we have a varied assortment of goodies um, to make sure we are well lubricated for an awesome episode. So um, let's get started. So first off, Beth, why don't you go first, introduce yourself, your role with the company, and what you like most about wine. Indeed. Thank you so much, Nick. Thrilled to be here and thrilled to be talking to your great crowd today about my favorite subject, my favorite things, wines, and wines in particular from Copper Cane Wines by Joe Wagner. I've been in the wine business for decades. I was told that's the appropriate way to say that I've been doing this a long ass time. But um, this is by far the very best job for the best company working for the best damn winemaker in the business, Mr. Joe Wagner. Wonderful. Michael? Absolutely, and just kind of uh I guess just back up what Beth said. Um, we work for, I believe, probably the best wine company in the business. Um, kind of along with Beth, I have 20 years in, in the business. Um, I cover Georgia, Alabama, where Beth does Tennessee, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama. Um, and it's uh, the reason I like wine is it's just kind of one of those things that it's, it's so complex. Um, it, it's, it's a beautiful thing in a bottle that, that you can pair with so many different things, foods, uh, events, just um, parties, everything. So, it's a uh, it's it's a fun business to be in. Yeah, and now Braves games. Yeah, and go, Braves add games. that to the list. I think you know, for me, I, I consider myself. I'm a big fan of wine. I've tried lots. I've been to different wine regions, a lot in different countries, and I, I very much enjoy the history and the art that goes into it. I think that if you look now, at, like most things, it's become very commercialized. I remember when I first went to Napa when I was 21, 20 years ago. Like you didn't pay for wine tasting; it was free because they wanted you to buy stuff. It was like mm. this crazy experience. Now you go to crappy vineyards in Long Island; they're like eighty six dollars for a tasting, <laughs> and like I think that. It, it bothers me a little bit because it's a price thing, right? When you start paying $40, $50 a bottle, the wines you can get from France should be better than the ones you can get from Long Island. Why am I paying $30? Because your venue costs a lot of money. Like, it just yeah. bothers me. So I think part of the mysticism of wine is differentiating the heritage brands, what's good, what's made by good winemakers versus what's good marketing. And I think that's the most exciting part of this conversation because it seems from what you guys have told me, um, Copper Cane and Joe have done a really good job of making really good wine but marketing it the right way, which is what I think will set you guys up for success. So we'll get into that stuff. Why don't we give either one of you a brief history of the brand, talk about Joe and how he got here, because I think that will frame the rest of the conversation. Excellent. Well, Joe is, uh, he is truly an gifted winemaker, but a true entrepreneur as well at heart. His motto is, all gas, no pedals. He is balls to the wall, ready to deliver great wine. He's not afraid to make mistakes. He, as I mentioned, is a fifth-generation winemaker. His family started Camus Winery in 1972. That was his grandfather. His grandfather was Chuck Wagner. His grandmother was Lorna Bell Gloss Wagner, which we can speak to a bit later, but the impetus for our beautiful Bell Gloss wines. But Joe grew up in this wine environment. It was a it was cab country, truly iconic wine family. He was making wine, started at 15 years old. He uh, 
ripped up an old vineyard and uh, planted grapes and told his dad this is what he wanted to do. So he knew at a very young age that this is where his heart and his passion lay. He was very passionate in particular about Pinot Noir, although it was Cabernet country in Napa Valley. He believed in the power of Pinot Noir. And in 2001, he made his very first release of the Belle Gloss wine, which he made in homage to his grandmother, Lorna Bell, first name. Sounds like a Southern girl. Yes, she does. Lorna Bell made a name was Gloss. There's now a, there's a Gloss Lane. You'll see if you go up Highway 29 in in Napa Valley. Also, long term wine making family. Lorna Bell Gloss Wagner, and he made the wine very beautiful on the inside to match the uh, the beautiful packaging on the outside. We've got this iconic red label. Yeah, which everyone knows very very well. But Joe was super passionate about. Pinot Noir and made really stunning Pinot Noir showcasing the coastal regions throughout California. And what was so cool is that his timing, and this is where he really has the gift, he's not afraid to take a risk. Everyone's drinking Cabernet. He wanted to make Pinot Noir. He did this 2001 vintage. 2004, the wine was released. And the movie Sideways I came out it. in 2005. I knew we were do it. Yep. Change the face of wine, and in particular Pinot Noir in America. Goodbye Merlot. Hello Pinot Noir. Good timing, Joe Wagner. This is the number one luxury Pinot Noir in the state of Georgia. Crazy. And in the country, and has been for 20 years. There's no topping Bell Gloss. Crazy. And I think the, the it's the cultural shifts, but it's also palate shifts. And I think as our our palates and cuisine expanded and we took on more kinds of food that we eat. And even in the past 20 years, I mean, there were restaurants that are opening up Filipino and Laotian that were not here. We didn't have Chinese restaurants in part of the country 30 years ago. Sure. So I yeah. think as palates adapt, wines adapt too, because cab has certain qualities that are always going to be a cab that I think Pinot Noir opens up different kind of tastes sure. and, and, and cuisines. Um, so I think really quickly, and I want to, Michael, first, you tell us what this is, and then I want you to do your best to set up American winemaking because I think it's important to understand like where how this started where the important regions are so your best to just set that up because then we're going to talk about what makes you guys stand out versus the rest of those clowns sure. so yeah. first let's let's talk about Indeed. the wine we have because I got to take a sip exactly Indeed. absolutely sorry um, for everyone at home yeah so what we have in the glass here is a California Sauvignon Blanc that we released what a month ago Beth exactly um, yeah. this is something that has been missing from our portfolio from Copper Cane pretty much the entire time that, that Joe has had it um, this is going to be um, from Lake County, Sonoma, and Lodi. Okay. Uh, oh, it, we got a Creedence Clearwater song in there. Yeah, yeah. right. One of my favorites, actually. We we always pair wine with music too. That's a very yeah. good thing. And it's uh, it, it's just like I said, it's it's a wine that we've that we've needed because the the category in itself, Sauvignon Blanc, is is extremely hot right yeah. now. And mostly and New Zealand and South Africa, right? Those are the regions that you New, get New Zealand for sure. But honestly, like when you, when you try this Sauvignon Blanc, it's it's not going to be as as American or Californian as as one would think. Okay, um, it, it definitely has the acidity. It, it's going to have a lot of the similar profiles that you're going to get out of New Zealand, which is what Joe, I think, is is phenomenal about with his winemaking. Is he looks at at all of the other regions that that you see around the world. And, and he tries or, or gets as close to, to, like, mimicking those regions within California yeah. to kind of showcase California yeah, and, like and, and how it can hold up against um, all of these old world wines. And, so you're, and, pay, you're paying homage. Sometimes yes. people try to go so far away that you lose the character of what the wine is, and you're just trying to make something to make something. So I, I certainly appreciate that because, you know, sometimes don't, broke, you know, don't break what's, what's not broken. Yep. Well, that's so in line with Joe because he understands that too. Because he's not trying to recreate. He is not trying to recreate Burgundy in California with Pinot yeah. Noir. He is not trying to recreate Loire Valley with our Sauvignon right. Blanc. Mm -hmm. But what he is doing is taking the aspects of those wines that make them so special, and then utilizing the fertile, beautiful land that we have in our own country here. Wines from California that belong on the map with the very best wines in the world. And Joe is here to show that we know how to do it and make yeah. it accessible to everyone. Yeah. All right. So we got Sauvignon Blanc, California. I haven't had many, if I'm not going to lie. Usually it is in New Zealand that you find the stores and the stuff my wife drinks. So. Yeah, it's not too bad at all. Mm -hmm. This is my new favorite wine, mm -hmm. the one that I plan on drinking all summer long. It is absolutely Yummy. perfection in a glass. It's Yummy. got 
it's yummy, right? Yummy. It is absolutely yummy. My daughter does not like when I use that word, but it is uh it is a delicious wine with great acidity. Yeah, my, great fruit, creamy on the palate, but not doesn't smack you with fruit first. A mm-hmm. lot of Sauvignon Blancs, I know that they're, they're dry, but they hit you really hard with that fruit first, mm-hmm. which is really hard to pair food with because if you're getting hit by the wine, it's, it takes away from what you have. This is a little softer on the front on the, the mm-hmm. front of the palate, then you have taste a little bit more on the back of the palate. Yeah. Yeah, it's very good. This wine, too, is uh, it's called Thread Count by Quilt. It's made uh, in, in the great tribute to our Quilt brand, which we can speak to as well. But we have been tasting this out in the marketplace with a lot of the chefs, like yeah. you say, and a lot of just consumers. And it is it just hits the nail on the head. In I think it would do well with uh, spicy, like mm-hmm. a Thai mm-hmm. food. Totally. I, I really You're taste saying, this with going yeah. with. I, I really I kind of enjoy it. Those are some of the harder things to pair with. Mm-hmm. I stay away from reds, a softer red. But this, because it's not too fruit forward, I think it matches well with something mm-hmm. like that. Um, all right, we got two minutes left in a second. Michael, let's clear out. Just give us briefly the state of California wine kind of versus the rest of the world because then we're going to talk about how we stand out in crowded marketplaces like we're in with marketing and with how you build a business. Yeah. I think like my personal opinion on on California, let's just say versus old world is is we are a young like young drinking um consumer base. Um when you think about total like wine consumers in the business, you look at at let's just say France, Italy, Spain, even South Africa. The amount of people that consume wine and, and have consumed wine for century, right? I think it's 70, 80 percent of the, the population consume wine to some degree. Yeah, I mean, I was drinking wine with my grandfather when I was six years old because he's born yep. in Florence and just like that's what you do. There's no let's get hammered. It's that's just what you do with your life. Like that's just what happens. Yep. So then you kind of transition back into California or U.S. based wines. And in us being young, you kind of look at, at what we as, as Americans are, are brought up on a, as well. Mm-hmm think about like sweet foods i feel like everything that we do is sweet right um and and i'm not saying american wines are sweet i'm just saying that american wines are pushed a little more having a little more fruit in it yeah because that's kind of what our palate and and the american consumer looks for i think over the next several decades that that may change as the palates just that i guess get better um and get used to the wine and, and people actually get into the wine category yeah um, that it will change with, with the palettes that, that will come along with Yeah, and I, I will, uh, as I've aged, you know, when I was young, I was like, oh, it was a Zinfandel with a steak. I'm not a big Zinfandel drinker anymore, but like a Tempranillo, Rioja, yeah. they seem softer when you taste them, but they're more complex on the back, as opposed to a lot of American wines I know, if they hit you, again, it's that initial smack of flavor, and then it kind of dies in the end. That doesn't fit food well. Mm-hmm. So, and again, I know Zinfandel is its own category, but that's when it just so whacks you in the face when you try it, that how many cuisines are you going to eat that that's going to really work with? Like barbecue and like a really big fatty steak. That's about it. Yep. So I think you're right. The palates are developing. Um, when we get back, we are gonna we're gonna continue the conversation about. It, but we're gonna really talk about how crowded the marketplace is and how hard it is for you guys to stand out uh, until you have Joe and you have a guy that's just going down there and kicking some butt for you. So you've been listening to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra 106.3, and we'll be right back. It's Christmas in July at D. Geller & Son Jewelers, and that means D. Geller Diamond Dollars are back. All month long, earn 20% back on any in-store purchase towards anything in the store. That means you can come shop engagement rings for that beautiful summer vacation proposal and earn Diamond Dollars to cover the wedding bands. Christmas in July at D. Geller & Son is the perfect opportunity to get more value for your summer shopping. So come shop with Atlanta's favorite jeweler, D. Geller & Son, this summer in Atlanta, Kennesaw, and Sandy Springs, and online at dgeller.com. This morning in the Atlanta airport, no one's missing a meal on Mac Wilburn's watch. With 11 restaurants to serve passengers, he's got dining for every destination. And it all started when Mac talked with First Horizon Bank about opening a franchise in the airport. Now it's open for business and cleared for takeoff. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Mac. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. Now back to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra 106.3 FM. Welcome back to the Marketing Mad Men, Trip Job, And yes, we have Maura Vetter uh, from the Marketing hello, Madhouse hello. joining us. And uh, Caesar Worm at a uh, great uh, kind of first segment. And I think... Uh, uh, first off, we're already, you know, we're stepping up the game with Nick, uh, you know, off uh, enjoying know, his umbrella drink somewhere. <laughs> so, it, it, you know, it, it's uh, healthy to take vacation. So I, w- I wish him all the best on his vacation. It, it <laughs> is. I, I'm just 
came off a, a four day myself, so it was wonderful just to uh, to have a little getaway. And uh, so we were talking, um, you know, loyalty programs, and, and I think what you said was was fantastic. You listen to your customer, unlike um, I think we saw in the industry in general. Mm-hmm. Delta's, uh, you know, when they restructured last year, and and obviously didn't ask their customers. Have you, you know, in your um, in your career or experience, kind of that? oops, you know, a lesson, so to speak, because you assumed or, or thought you had heard your customers and uh, realized uh, maybe that wasn't the case? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, a lot of times you, <laughs> of course, you try to avoid, but mm-hmm. a lot of times you go even meeting with an owner or a customer where you believe, you, you go with the best possible intentions, but you, you believe you know where they're coming from or what they mm-hmm. would like to hear or what they're expecting to find halfway through the conversation that you completely miss the mark and and sometimes just asking a few more questions or taking that time mm-hmm. to pause versus jumping to assumptions because sometimes you can be so focused on what you do and you've been doing that for years yeah. <laughs> that are just yeah. on cruise control. <laughs> I, you know, I think that the, the phrase loyalty is an interesting one because in any of the – this is a true relationship, and I think mm-hmm. there are differences between coupon programs and reward mm-hmm. programs – and loyalty programs, which, yeah. which implies a relationship. And when I think about some of the things that occurred coming off of the pandemic and just even in the last year, some companies have had to reset structures and policies because you do mm-hmm. have to also look at the economics of it, right? It is what mm-hmm. the consumer wants, but you also as a business have to be able to support these programs. And I think, you know, if you actually have a loyal following and mm-hmm. you can speak to them, you know, back to Delta, I think Ed Bash and, you know, tried to speak very directly to what the program is and, you know, uh, how how they can adjust it and how they can do better. But sometimes part of it has to stick. No, absolutely. And I'm glad you brought up, because um, I remember when I first joined Kimberly Clark, that, you know, within marketing, um, promotion was its own area. Uh-huh. And at that point, I hate to say how far back that was. Mm. But loyalty really wasn't even thought of. I mean, mm-hmm. you had brand, mm-hmm. um, but eventually they got to the point, especially in personal care and family care, mm-hmm. where they started to develop yeah. loyalty. But they always, again, promotion was completely separate. But I yeah. think some some uh, companies kind of see it all together. They think, oh, it's just a way to provide a discount. And I think, you know, you're trying to get an experience, especially on yeah. the premium side. Yeah. And that's probably the last thing in your mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a it's a great point. It's like how can you continue to deliver what the customers want, and especially in our space, without increasing costs to owners. So mm-hmm. you got to find that mm-hmm. fine balance. And uh, you know, to your point, I mean, it's it's commendable how Ed Bastian attack you know came back. Right? Mm-hmm. He he realized that hey, you know, we could have done few things differently. Mm-hmm and acknowledge mm-hmm. what they they missed and what yep. has to be it is what it yep. is and what they can do differently and and i think there's a big lesson for all of us when uh, i think people appreciate the honesty the transparency yep. and um you may not always agree or be happy with yep. it but you say okay i get it you know i think too sometimes um you know it doesn't always have to be a deep discount or a deep experience or de- it's, it's just a little something when you don't expect it you know is, is mm-hmm. another thing and um, American Express is a company that you know goes a long way and um, I'm a long loyal customer of American Express <laughs> but a couple you know of course I get rewards I get you know I'm tied to Delta with the Amex you know there's lots of ways that I get monetary you know or or things that have a a specific value but uh last year i had a package sent to me from american express it was a dimensional package with a uh recharging brick right a very nice upscale recharging brick and you know Mm -hmm. had a really nice message with it so i think sometimes it's just saying hey we remember you're here right whether you're unexpected yes whether you're using your points or you're doing whatever it's just thank you and yeah. and that that goes a long way too, acknowledging people. Yeah, in our in our industry, we call surprise and delight. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, yeah, how do you a, get that across the, that those best practices to maybe the franchise owners? Yes. Um, again, you've got different levels. You've got mm-hmm. some that are probably company owned and some that are franchise. So you've got to balance sure. that. But mm-hmm. how do you, you know, how do you go about 
trying to get them to see the potential and doing some things that they may view as a cost. Sure. And you view it as, hey, this yes. is a real upsell opportunity. As an invest. Yes. Yeah, I, I think one thing we benefit in our industry is that we have a lot of data points, which mm-hmm. sometimes it can be almost too much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but generally speaking, we're able to get, you know, real time the customer sentiment. Uh, mm-hmm. So be able to correlate that to, okay, whenever we get this type of uh, breakfast uh, satisfaction level, you really kind of start hurting or benefiting us financially and the yeah. ability to have return and so on. So yeah. you can start correlating all those to, to your point, go back and say, listen, if we invest in these key areas, you're going to be able to see a financial ROI. Yep. And then also is also correlating. There's unfortunately there is certain things that you can do to customers that don't necessarily have a, an immediate ROI, mm-hmm. but it helps towards that loyalty. Yep. Where uh, you know just because you really made their kids feel special or you sent them a card, it may be the reason why they return to your hotel, which mm-hmm. is, is tough to make it tangible. Yeah. Yep. But I think just those little touch points and. Um, recommendations that we see across many of our hotels across the globe, we have a good insight into that. Mm-hmm. I, I have a question, and um, I, I didn't hear the first half, yeah. so you could have covered this, but <laughs> uh, it may be an inside baseball question. And we are mm-hmm. in a sports uh, a sports radio uh, place, so so a baseball is an is an important analogy. But um, when you you know you're dealing with premium brands, and uh-huh. you know you bring up costs, mm-hmm. and I know that all business people are aware there are costs and there's you know income and and there's a balance of that but do you struggle with premium franchise owners and the costs or or as premium brands are they more likely to roll out the red carpet do they automatically assume indulging certain things or going you know two extra miles is something that is expected as a premium brand versus you know giving an extra customer experience yeah, it, it, um, I think it varies. It's interesting because the, within our owners groups, there is many different type of ownership mm-hmm. groups from families that own mm-hmm. one hotel or mm-hmm. a group of hotels to institutional investors, which is long-term holders. Right, and, right. Uh, so I think that that helps a little bit, differentiates their appetite for mm-hmm. You know, going a little bit the extra by their either experience or mm-hmm. patience with their return or whatever the case mm-hmm. may be. Uh, but in general, uh, thankfully, most people within the hospitality industry kind of gets, uh, you know, what what is needed and what would be nice to to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but to your point, I think it was a, you know, the. The pandemic, in a way, made us reset and look at things very efficiently. Right. Which he- heavy costs. Exactly. Right. So, so I think you know because we really um, it was really challenging the first couple of years, but then when we came back, um, you know, a lot of people traveled a lot, like right. probably we right. did, right. because you couldn't travel for a yeah. couple of years, and then uh, you start kind of seeing, okay, now we can found efficiencies that we didn't have before right. just because of right. back you, you had to survive. Yeah. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. to your point, okay, how can I drive efficiency and perhaps um, redirect some of the spent that I had before that was not geared towards the customer satisfaction mm-hmm. to now give that extra right. attention. Right. Yeah, so I've seen one of the things I've noticed in the last year, year and a half is going back to that choice. Yeah. A lot of times when I'm checking in, sometimes even before, I'm getting a choice, if, especially if it's more than a one night. If I'm uh-huh. there two or three nights, choice on housekeeping, right? yeah. choice on you know other amenities. Do I want them available or not? And yeah. I assume it's that balance of, you know, there's probably some cost savings as well. But sure. you, it's being positioned more so as, how would you like us to serve you during your stay? Right. Correct. Mm-hmm. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sometimes people choose to not do a service because they're more sustainable right mm-hmm. sustainability aspects some people's like hey just leave me alone i yep. don't want to interact yep. with Privacy. anyone yep. mm-hmm. right. and sometimes they want all the attention they can get right. mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah you're spot on yeah mm-hmm. any other trends that you're you've seen kind of post covid as, as things have come back um what else uh, are you trying to do and then you know in some of the premium brands at least 
Yeah, I, I think it's always uh, constantly looking how to evolve. So I think to your point earlier, the our discussion, we kind of uh, focused a lot on the customers coming out of the pandemic mm -hmm. and how we can ensure that we can gain that loyalty mm -hmm. and really earn it mm -hmm. and not just be one of the options, but be the choice, the, choice. the preferred mm -hmm. choice. Um, and then also now with the costs rising substantially, we all experience when you go and you know shop anywhere. Um, so our owners experiencing that, especially mm -hmm. now with uh, interest rates that high, cost of construction high, a uh, big area for us is to continue to look at efficiencies when we develop new mm -hmm. hotels, similar to the guest experiences. Like, okay, we have this square footage, mm -hmm. how we can truly maximize right. to drive as much revenue generation opportunity as possible within the building mm -hmm. while not compromising the guest experience and lowering the cost of build. Mm -hmm. Is it easier to do that with new brands? We talked before about the premium brands and, and Indigo is one. I yes. think it's kind of neat. Yep. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, very cool. Um, yeah. And I would imagine that some of that would be harder if you're trying to take some of the trends in a Crown Plaza or whatever, but is bringing a new brand like that, is that able to allow you to do some things completely different? Yes, it's, it makes it easier. Uh, so a lot of um, we, over the last years, we grew substantial amount of brands in our portfolio, mm -hmm. some through yes. purchasing, yep. mm -hmm. such as Six Senses and even mm -hmm. Kimpton uh, mm -hmm. several years ago. But then also we have new hotels that brands that we developed such as you know, at Well Suites or mm -hmm. Avid, uh, that really, to your point, allows us to really ensure that from the beginning on we have an optimal mm -hmm. solution. To mm -hmm. so you 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 do that, but even with um, more established brands like a Holiday Inn or a Crown Plaza, where I was looking for ways to okay, there's not that many new builds necessarily mm -hmm. in comparison mm -hmm. to operating hotels, but when an owner goes and renovate, what are the savings and efficiencies we can help mm -hmm. them provide through mm -hmm. the design, through the sourcing materials and so on. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's that's a never stops when mm -hmm. <laughs> when we launch a one, we're already kind of looking, okay, what's okay. gonna be the next generation a few years down the road. Have you have you gone down the dual brand path? I have noticed it. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, with a few out there where the yeah. hotel literally is is split in two. Yes. Mm -hmm. With two brands. Yes. Yes. Explain and, that a little bit. Yeah, it's it's an interesting concept because um, um, it, hotels... It's and, a great A-B test yeah. of, of where the appetite is, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, and, and I think a lot of times it it's a, there's different reasons for it. Uh, for example, sometimes it just may be that just having one brand with that number of keys may just not fit the demand in that mm -hmm. market. So if you have two different brands that speaks to different clientele mm -hmm. may drive better results. Mm -hmm. Sometimes if uh, retrofit, uh, depending on the building, uh, either would cost too much, right, to, mm -hmm. to fit just one brand. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is different reasons. Uh, and also sometimes it's just from the development lens that there is a better value proposition for whatever the case may be. Maybe the offering, the market, maybe what's coming from the city development standpoint that then will make that uh, real estate asset more valuable with so, so back to Maura's point yeah. about A-B testing yeah. and that investment, mm -hmm. if you believe that maybe we can, you know, we have a, an opportunity to move up to the premium category and, but we're not sure we can do it in a 220 hotel room that if it's split, yeah. you know, and mm -hmm. it's a hundred rooms, Right then, you've got an opportunity to kind of test that, and maybe a minor investment compared to a full-blown refurb. Exactly. Do exactly. you ha do you have? Because this is something I see a lot with QSR right now is the, um, you know, sort of closing up shop on some stores and reopening, which has yeah. always been a thing. But there's a lot, you know, talking about looking at costs and cost economy. Do you ever have that where somebody? Uh, maybe needs a different location and they, uh, you know, I, I don't know how the, the agreements go with mm -hmm. the owners, but we're not mm -hmm. going to have this location here. We instead want to have this location over here or replatforming to a different brand that might be more relevant in an area. And so, sure. We're, we're, yeah. Sure, yes, that absolutely that happens. Uh, you know, usually 
our deals within our industries, you know, is very decent mm -hmm. length of years, usually yeah. 20 years yeah. plus, oh, whatever okay. the so case Okay, so really extended, be. yeah. But there is, of course, instances where it may uh, be a one-off or the hotel is coming towards the end of the term and mm -hmm. the hotel, imagine how a, yeah. a, a market can evolve in, yeah. in two decades. So it may still be very relevant or mm -hmm. maybe, hey, you have a brand that's a better fit that mm -hmm. would like to, you know, fit into that. Or listen, I'm going to sell my asset just because yeah. I, I can make so much money now and I see opportunity in another yeah. market. Yeah. So that's the beauty of having the relationship with our owners. Sometimes uh, you can grow with them. Sometimes you become uh, net uh, even mm -hmm. with the, the mm -hmm. change that happens. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes uh, there's opportunities that um, you can really help them continue to grow and see other opportunities. Mm -hmm. And um, we always want to be the the option, right? Yeah. Their preferred choice. But sometimes sure. it's you know it, it we're saturated in the market, whatever yeah. the case may be. Yeah. Sure. You know, we talked a little bit about um, flexibility around loyalty, and we've, we've hit a little bit on experiences. Uh -huh. I know that in the past, you, you guys have done some things around loyalty and experiences, and, and Holiday Inn was tied in with Major League Baseball for a while. Yeah. And how are you viewing that? I mean, I have seen that as a trend yeah. where many hospitality programs are not just offering the room, but offering the room and other experiences, either in a paid perspective or maybe as an option. So what, what are mm -hmm. you doing and what are you seeing along those lines? Yes, it's uh, it's interesting because this ties to a couple of things. We, when we relaunched our loyalty program, we, as we were talking before the first mm -hmm. segment, you know, not, not everyone knows what IHG stands for, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So it's IHG Hotels and Resorts. So we did uh, the master brand mm -hmm. uh, and really spent a lot of money and created partnerships around that with the mm -hmm. U.S. Open, a lot of advertisements around the SEC mm -hmm. uh, last year. So to create that awareness level mm -hmm. and say, hey, we are these 19 brands and right. we That's have crazy. a little bit to offer for everyone. And... The more as part of that research and what we hear from customers is that, of course, they want a fantastic experience. Mm -hmm. They want to have their needs and wants taken care of when mm -hmm. their hotel. Mm -hmm. But also what really makes it memorable and makes them more open to be loyal to us is having those experiences that are really memorable. So mm -hmm. us having the ability to, to your point, even offer through a packaging in a hotel. Mm -hmm. And or through the loyalty program, say, hey, you can redeem X, Y, and Z mm -hmm. experience mm -hmm. uh, to meet someone famous, attend, uh, you know. Breakfast uh, with a yeah. Disney character. Yeah, 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 yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they would be talking yeah. about it forever. Yeah. And that's yeah. something that um, we, we try to find the balance and always have that those offers on the table. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You know, you, the other thing you hit, and I am going to date myself, but when I was at Emory, mm -hmm. so yeah. three plus decades ago, <laughs> um, we had a strategy class. And so we each had to pick uh, an industry and a company and, and mm. talk about how they looked at strategy and portfolio. And it was actually IHG at the time. Wow. And yeah. seeing all the different brands back mm -hmm. then, and some of them are still there, yeah. some of them are not. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, that perspective, you know, again, while I was studying before I got out, and I think it's there's a tremendous lesson out there of really looking at a full portfolio, not mm -hmm. a single mm -hmm. brand, but understanding where the portfolio meets, yeah. it meets customers and how you need to look mm -hmm. at it and how you structure it. Yeah. And maybe just talk a little bit about, cause you've been at, at different levels within yes. ISG and also mm -hmm. you stepped out away from mm -hmm. a little, for a little yeah. while. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I got, got the opportunity to work with different brands, mm -hmm. with uh, hotel management companies, mm -hmm. right? That you're the yeah. franchisee. Mm -hmm. And so you get to experience a little bit of everything and see how, how things works. And it's, uh, especially within the hospitality industry, it's really an area that you can't be too... Um, cautious or, or too slow to react because to your point the generational changes mm -hmm. or customers mm -hmm. expectations are always evolving yep. so at one point in time you may not have necessarily a white space yep. that 
but then suddenly in a few years, right, right there's a new right. uh, a new group a new with a group, new something. A new, yeah, yeah. And then you say, wow, this is really something that I got to work on. Mm-hmm. So hence a lot of the new brands, not only within our company, but within the industry. And I think that Usawa is going to continue to evolve. And if you look at most recently, there is a lot of that in kind of more the soft brands, even if you look kind of Airbnb, mm-hmm, right, and mm-hmm. really exploded, is because uh, a lot of uh, customers that before didn't have the option to have a more flexible, more unique experience. Mm-hmm, so it's mm-hmm. all always very branded and, you know, whatever you mm-hmm, experience in mm-hmm. Atlanta, you experience in L.A. and New mm-hmm, York. Mm-hmm. And now there's a lot of offerings that each place you go is unique and different mm-hmm. and fun. So mm-hmm. there's definitely a clientele there that probably 15 years ago that was – not an offering, mm-hmm. not an right. option. No, I, 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 you're spot on, and I think that ability to be a little more flexible, but also when you understand your portfolio, you learn where are the hard lines of what you mm-hmm. are and what you're not. I yes, think that's very important. There's hard lines, and then there's soft lines to react. Yes, you, you know, I um I also uh, did some time on IHJ on a few of the brands, and it, <laughs> it was really interesting because to your point. It's a case study in personas, right? And and mm. it, it is one company, but you have to constantly, you know, it's it's the it's the classic, know your audience, right, and understand who the customer is here. And and the engagements that I worked on were with the brand team, and the e-commerce group. And so we had a common wireframe, but we had to build each brand experience very specifically. And we had to bring at the time it was um, was. It Priority Club, right, was yeah. what it was previously. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was a component of that, but each brand had to be separate and really understanding each of, the, you know, it's Crown Plaza. We're now talking about events and event planners and yeah. how do you cater to event planners mm-hmm. and then Holiday and Express was the breakfast and the bun and the yeah. shower and, you know, and all, all those things. Yeah. But it was not just how do we talk about the things we feature, but how do people experience these brands and you know i think that is you know it it also helps you keep a strong business you know Mm -hmm. you have a diverse portfolio that has different things that appeal to different people as you said different generations you can't just let the brand remain static Uh, absolutely and when when we come back from the break we'll dive in a little bit to how you can react to some of those things so you've hit a few of them but want to want to go into that a little bit more so you're listening to the marketing mad men on extra 106.3 and we'll be right back A lifetime of hard work, children laughing in the kitchen, family photos on a restaurant wall, a legacy that lives on. It all comes from the power of a conversation, like the one Tommy Hall had with First Horizon Bank about taking over his father's Charleston-based restaurant business. Now the table is set for a whole new generation. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Tommy. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. It's Christmas in July at D. Geller & Son Jewelers, and that means D. Geller Diamond Dollars are back. All month long, earn 20% back on any in-store purchase towards anything in the store. That means you can come shop engagement rings for that beautiful summer vacation proposal and earn Diamond Dollars to cover the wedding bands. Christmas in July at D. Geller & Son is the perfect opportunity to get more value for your summer shopping. So come shop with Atlanta's favorite jeweler, D. Geller & Son, this summer in Atlanta, Kennesaw, and Sandy Springs, and online at dgeller.com. Now back to the Marketing Mad Men on Extra 106.3 FM. Welcome back to the Marketing Mad Men. Nick Constantino here with Beth Nowak and Michael Smith of Copper Cane Wines um, by Joe, who you've heard a lot about. Next, we got to get Joe on the show. I don't know what you guys got to pull to get him over here, but uh, I need a wine making class and I need to get schooled in some of this stuff. Um, so before we get to our pop quiz, all I want to say is, is that there are a few things in the world that bring people together. One of the reasons I love sports is a grand unifier. It doesn't matter if you are a Democrat, Republican, blue, white, black, red, valet parker, CEO, you can talk sports together. We are in a world where, unfortunately, people divide, and I'm sick of it, and that's what we do. The other thing is food and wine. If you've never been around a table with someone making some food and drinking some wine together, you don't know what life is. Uh, it's not a criticism. I'm just saying you should go out and do it. And it doesn't matter the price point. You know what? Pay more for the wine. Learn to cook the 
the food. A lot of these dishes that you're paying for in restaurants, risotto costs nothing to make. You know, you can do a cacio e pepe. It costs nothing to take pepper and butter and pasta made together. You put love into it, anything's wonderful. So I could tell that Joe puts love into it. I could tell you guys put love into what you do, and I'm thrilled about that. Now, we are going to play pop quiz. So I am going to say a type of a style or type of wine and or a food, and I want you to tell me which style or type of wine you would pair it with. Um, so, so Aaron, you want to join in here? You come go on, say, Aaron. yeah, Absolutely. yeah, come on, come on in, come on in. You can hit. Oh, you're you're in now. So here's what we're gonna do. So we have Erin Fleming in here also. She <laughs> Hi, started Aaron. in sales hey, for us guys. like six days ago, so she's getting thrown into the fire <laughs> no here. So um, right. let's start. Um, we're gonna start simple and we're gonna get more complex. So awesome. let's start with uh, oysters. So raw oysters. Let's not so, oh. let's not talk about freaking Rockefeller. Don't cook your oysters. Real <laughs> oysters that they're shucking for you fresh. What do you go with? Me personally, I'm gonna go with the Red Count Sauv Blanc. That's just my personal opinion of, of and I, and I, I love want. it and the reason I love it is because yes. good oysters are briny and I think That's that right. would go well with a brine yeah. and a nice see I wouldn't put a mignette if I was using a cab sauce because a mignette has too many flavors that are like but I would go with a hot sauce or I would like a little Tabasco and a, and a little the brine wonderful what about mm. you Beth I, mean, I think Michael's on point with Savion Blanc I would think any Loire white would go really well maybe a Chenin Blanc would be really really cool and at the end of the day, I'm a champagne girl. Ah, there it is. Oh. Yeah. I mean, come on. Yes. If, you're, if you're serving oysters, I'm drinking champagne. That's a, you know what? That's Dang. that's a that's a pre-drink thing, right? Yeah. That's not dinner. That's mm. 4 p.m. You yeah, know what? Yeah. I'm feeling saucy. Yeah. It's champagne and oyster Let's go. time. Yeah. Aaron, what you got, girl? Uh, I, you know, that's an appetizer. That's a that's a whew, that, that's a that's a night starter for me. So. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I agree with Beth. I'm Let's on, drink some bubbles. I'm on TV. Yeah, absolutely. All, right. all day. And since we're talking about bubbles, we have a Belle Gloss Sparkling coming in yes. August of this year. No yeah. way. Blanc de Blanc and a sparkling rosé. And all I right. think, if I'm being Another honest, tasting. I think where that's the most room in the wine industry is in the sparkling category. Yes. Because people in their head believe you have to either have champagne or Vouve or a, mm -hmm. uh, Prosecco. And there's so much room in that category for experimentation. I cannot wait to see where that goes. But you said, you made a great point. You kind of let it slip. You're like Vouve because that's what you think of when you think of bubbles and you think totally. of luxury. And that is really cool for them that they have established that niche in the category. That it's almost, it's like Kleenex for them. And mm -hmm. that's, how, that's how we've become with luxury Pinot Noir with Belle Gloss, but it's true is that there's certain call brands and that's one. We want to yeah. do that with Belle Gloss. Uh, yeah, and you go, I mean, again, and, and when you look really into Dom and Moet Chandon and all these things, yeah. the heritage is there. I don't think that they're really listening to their customers of what mm -hmm. they want and making wine based on what people want. I think they're like, screw you. You want to talk about stuffy? The Moet Castle, wherever they're making that stuff from is the definition of stuffy. So let's get away from stuffy. I'm going to throw mm -hmm. you guys off now. Fried chicken. Oh, great one. Mm. Oh, that's easy. It's that's, easy. Oh. To me, yeah, to me, it's any of our Pinot Noirs. Okay. Uh, but say. since we have it on the table, the, mm. the Russian River Bowen that yeah. we have, um, because the majority of our Pinot Noir are more medium body. I mean, you get into Belle Gloss, you, you get a little more um, uh, just heaviness with, with kind of that Pinot. But all of our Bowen would 100% go with chicken. Mm. What you got, Beth? I mean, fried chicken is such a perfect food that... <laughs> It honestly, there's not a lot that doesn't pair well with fried chicken, to be quite honest. I mean, it's just true. It's true because anyone with some acidity is going to cut right through that. I would I would go with rosé, though. I would be mm. Pinot, rosé of Pinot Noir, same yep. vein, but rosé of Pinot Noir, maybe the Belle Gloss rosé or Elouan rosé with fried chicken. Aaron, what you got, girl? I mean, fried and So Aaron is... I didn't know how Southern she was when I interviewed her. <laughs> okay, and then she when knows. she was talking, I was like, where did that come from? So if someone knows fried chicken, I'm going to bet she does. Go Listen, ahead, Listen, I mean, fried chicken for me, I, w I was sitting on Stone Mountain, side of Stone Mountain with a bucket of KFC. Nice. Like, constantly growing up, all right? So, Good for you. So I, t typically, I think KFC, fried chicken bucket, and, uh, you know, I I'm just drinking... I'm just drinking something out of a can. There you go. So, Another girl. But, That's okay, too. But after I've tried all this, guys, I mean... I, I'm I'm trying to see what's in that uh, that that bottle over here. So I I got a lot of options here. You, you got do. a lot of you options. Do. So yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this all off, and only because I had it one time, and I had a rosé champagne with fried oh. chicken, and it was so mm. freaking good. Perfection. So good because because the fried chicken's a lot. It's got a lot on it, especially if you have it's a good heavy. fried chicken. It's heavy, so that bubbles kind of break it up a little bit. Yeah. So that yeah. was one I enjoyed. Yeah, I like all right, it. this one's gonna be a, this one's gonna be a little harder. We're gonna. I, I don't want to say Thai food, so let's go a little like Malaysian, or let's go someone that's got some mm. Indian, some spice, spice coming in, and some curry. So mm. let's talk like a spicy Bangladeshi or a Thai or okay. something with heavy curry and heavy spices and a lot of richness going on. But I, I think we kind of crossed that bridge a little mm -hmm. bit ago when we tried Thread Count Sauv Blanc. Mm -hmm. And just kind of tie, like uh, to me, just tying all of this in, 
with what Beth said earlier about Joe, go with your palate. Mm-hmm. The beautiful thing about wine is we're all, all different. saying something different. different. Totally. Mm-hmm. And and that's like I said, that's the beautiful thing about wine and food is is go with what you like. Go with your palate. If if you like a red, pair it. If yeah. you like rosé. And everyone's yeah. spice tolerance, right? I say totally. spicy, but I'm going in and saying Thai spicy, and then I'm pulling the waitress out and be like, no, 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 Thai spicy. Don't white boy Thai spicy me. I want Thai <laughs> spicy. Give me Thai spicy. So, like, I'm going to have a different hot. wine. I'm going to have a different wine than someone who's going in and, like, Thai spicy. Yeah. So, yeah. again, your pal- everyone's perception and palate, it is, all these things are different. So, um, Beth, what you got? Mm. So, that's a... Michael makes a great point, and you make a great point. We're all so smart. It's just blows my mind. <laughs> That's what uh, you're Aaron trying to you say. Too. Aaron, trying you to too. Say. I mean, and the more quilt cab I have, the more I feel just like get smarter and smarter genius. and smarter. I'm smart, and you're smart too. <laughs> no, um, for any type of Asian, I'm big on Pinot, but mm-hmm. when you but. But I'm, we drink, we eat so much Thai food in our house, so that's why I always go with Pinot. But I will tell you, when you start talking about more like Malaysian or Indian, mm-hmm. I might get a little bit spicier, and I might go to more a blend, something that's got some Zin mm-hmm. in it, or that can hold up to it because Zin can be off-putting. But if you pair it with the right food, so something like a thread count red blend, I think would be a perfect wine for Malaysian. I, or I would for, say or, I would agree with you, and like a Penang curry with the nut, the nuttiness mm, in too. Mm, a zin would be really good because yeah. it doesn't have much fruit forward, yeah, so you're yeah. bringing the fruit into yeah, the nuttiness. Totally. I think that would be wonderful. Aaron, you got anything, girl? I really like the Sauv Blanc. I mean, I that that was so good, and it just the the flavor of it, and it just wasn't too it wasn't too fruity, yep. and it just it, it just really cut you know. So I, I'm going to go against your guys' brands just on this one because I don't know if you make a Riesling, but I would go with a off dry, mm. like a dry oh, nice. Riesling, yeah, or for something sure. like okay. that. And I've had many Rieslings many different ways. It seems to be a, either a cheap something to make or a lot that they mm. make in these crappy vineyards all across the U.S. where yeah. they do the stainless steel. In the Northeast, versus, yeah, they do the stainless steel versus. Yeah. But then I've started getting into uh, a drier Riesling, a Lumi Grout liner or something like that too mm. that has a little bit more of that with a little bit more dry but spice to it, and I think that would go well with um, with that kind of food also. Usually that's actually so sweet. Well, no, that's. No, that, that's, that's why I said dry. That's the bad exposure that yeah. you've had. I'm so oh, sorry reason. because yeah. actually Joe's family is half of his family is is, is uh, Alsatian, and if you ask oh. Joe Wagner that same question, he I'll will say, answer. The, the, a friend, the French, he will right? answer. Yeah, he will France. answer. Yeah, Alsace. What it was kind of on the border of yeah. France, mm-hmm. Germany. But so that's kind a, of there's a really great mm-hmm. restaurant in Decatur that, so. that serves that kind of cuisine. Nice. It serves that Alsatian, Alsatian, Alsatian. We are smart. Oh my god, we are so smart. I mean, we are smart and we are cultured. And, and awesome looking yes. also for the yes. camera. Uh, yeah, we are gorgeous. <laughs> so good looking. <laughs> oh, man. So, all, right, all right, let's end with this one, okay? So this is one that is near and dear to my heart. So we're going to talk about a nice ragu or a nice bolognese. Mm. Now, to be clear, because there's a lot of different kinds of bolognese, I'm going to throw you guys off here. I want a veal bolognese. Mm. So we're going to take ground veal or we're going to take a chop and cook the meat down and have that veal flavor mm. in there, a veal bolognese. You don't find it in a lot of menus. It's a damn shame. It's one of the best things on earth you can eat, but a veal bolognese. Go. So for me, this is going to be our Belle Gloss, um, probably Los Alturas for mm-hmm. me. It's, it's just big, balanced. It can handle a, a lot of flavor, and I think that's what that dish is throwing at it. Mm. So for me, Belle Gloss, Los Alturas. Wonderful. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you say that, Michael, because once again, you're very smart. Um I agree with you. Um, if I'm if I'm eating that food, I may go Italian, but if I uh, just to have an Italian wine with Italian food. However, what I will say is uh, our Pinot Noir, and in particular La Solturis, you will find it like I think La Grotta loves that wine, and it goes because it pairs so well with the right kind of ragu, and, and I think it, it it similar in style to the great old world Italian res is that it's got the right acidity, it's got the right body, and it's got the right complexity to pair with something as cool as that. Um, as that Bill Ragu. Yeah, I was going to throw Chianti out here just to sound smart like I know what I'm talking about about Italy, but I'm going to uh, change my thing and say Super Tuscan. And go. for those who don't know the story uh, of Super Tuscan, the government of Italy would not give them permission to make the wine, so they said, screw you, and they called it something completely different, and they called it a Super Tuscan, which gives me that rebellious age. But I think, actually, the Super Tuscan is probably closer in, port- in, in its taste profile to what you guys are talking about mm-hmm. with your Pinots yes. than a Chianti, because Chianti would be lighter. That Super Tuscan has got a lot mm-hmm. more of that. Yep. Um, so... Holy crap, we did good. What do you guys think? This is I think this pop quiz is going to go out as its own segment. Just love it. school people. I love it. You know, and I think that the conclusion is that we are smart, good looking, and cultured. We got that. But All let's that. not forget about Joe. So let's tell everybody where to find your wines, where to find information on Joe again, and then we'll close this puppy out. Absolutely. The wines are Copper Cane by Joe Wagner. They are available throughout Atlanta and the Southeast. You just need to ask for it by name. Ask for Quilt, Bell Gloss, Thread Count, Elowan, or Bowen. And the best place to enjoy is at Truist Park at the next Braves game. 
Come to the Bell Gloss Back Porch. Come find our L1 bar. Come find our Bell, our Bow and Keg stations. Or if you're in a suite, ask for our wines because they are available. There you go. You got anything to close out with, Mike? No, just other than uh, exactly what Beth said, uh, just just find our wines all over the state, all over the southeast, all over the U.S., especially in Truist. Um, Coppercane.com. We do have a DTC, so you mentioned the Riesling earlier. Oh, yeah. So we do have a Riesling called Lock and Key. Love it. It's uh, definitely the drier style. So for, and an Albarino, too. Yeah, and an Albarino. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, enjoy wine, go with your palate, drink Copper Cane, go Braves. Love it. And if yeah. you're hearing this episode, it means that Joe approved it. So you've been listening to the Marketing <laughs> Man on Extra 106.3, and we'll catch you next week. Uh, yeah. It's Christmas in July at D. Geller & Son Jewelers, and that means D. Geller Diamond Dollars are back. All month long, earn 20% back on any in-store purchase towards anything in the store. Get yourself a beautiful new gold necklace, diamond earrings, or a new timepiece, and save up those diamond dollars to buy a loved one a Christmas gift later. Christmas in July at D. Geller & Son is the perfect opportunity to get more value for your summer shopping. So come shop with Atlanta's favorite jeweler, D. Geller & Son, this summer in Atlanta, Kennesaw, and Sandy Springs, and online at dgeller.com. A lifetime of hard work, children laughing in the kitchen, family photos on a restaurant wall, a legacy that lives on. It all comes from the power of a conversation, like the one Tommy Hall had with First Horizon Bank about taking over his father's Charleston-based restaurant business. Now the table is set for a whole new generation. First Horizon Bank, let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Tommy. First Horizon Bank, member FDIC. Hey, Atlanta, Hudson Mason here. Is a new roof still on your to-do list, but you've been delayed due to rising home service costs? Well, here's a fantastic solution from Accent Roofing Service. Zero down, zero payments, and zero interest for a full year. That's right. You can get your new roof now and start paying next year. Act quickly because Accent's incredible offer of zero, zero, zero with a 12-month deferred payment option for a lifetime roof system isn't going to last long. Contact the craftsman at Accent Roofing Service today, accentroofingservice.com. 